and we are back for the Season 6, Episode 9, Serious Q&A. Do you think D&D are trying to stall major plot points so they can base future seasons off the next books when they finally release? I think that was the strategy a year ago when they wrote the scripts for this season. I think they fully thought that The Winds of Winter would be out by now. But now they have to sit down and write season 7 without The Winds of Winter. If you look at this season, we've had some big reveals like the White Walkers and some crazy important deaths like Bloodraven, Roos, and Doran. But most of the stories have hardly moved at all. I still feel like we're only at the end of A Dance with Dragons, or perhaps a chapter or two past. This is essentially where we were at the end of Season 5. The Northern story battled for Winterfell again, the Slaver's Bay story battled for Marine again, Arya rebelled against the Faceless Men again, Brienne wandered away and then came back, River Run was taken and River Run was given back, ships were burned and ships were replaced, the Hound was at peace and then not again, Sam is no nearer to Old Town, the White Walkers are no nearer to the Wall, and King's Landing is no nearer to Cersei's trial. Hopefully there'll be some big movements in Episode 10. I feel like we've waited eight episodes to get to these final two. Considering the countless errors in judgment they make in book and show, why do most fans seem to root for House Stark over all other houses? They seem to be careless and let emotions get the best of them, yet they are, for the most part, the fan favorite. Well, I think that's simply the structure of fiction. The reader naturally relates and roots for who they perceive as the protagonist. And in many ways, this is a function of time and relatability. The more normal the protagonist is to the audience, the easier it is for the audience to relate to him or her. The more time spent with the character, the more invested the audience becomes. Now, I don't have any figures for the show, but in the book, the Starks are 50% of the perspective. House Lannister, by comparison, is only about 20%. House Targaryen is 9%, and House Greyjoy is 8%. And on top of time, though the Starks may be emotional dumbasses, they are the most normal characters we have presented. Jon Snow is the classic, boring, white male heterosexual protagonist aged 18 to 35. And guess who the prime demographic of Game of Thrones is? To put it simply, Jon Snow is Keanu Reeves. What's interesting is that chapter and page count-wise, the main character of Ice and Fire should be Tyrion. But, as I said, the perception of being the protagonist is a function of both time and relatability. Most readers can't imagine themselves as murderous, genius, whore-loving dwarves. Now, I think George R. R. Martin has quite cleverly presented Jon Snow as the protagonist so that we think that the White Walkers are the antagonists. He has structured the story in a way that siding with the protagonists is akin to being a nationalist or a racist or a culturalist. The reader sides with House Stark and hates its enemies just as people are taught to side with their nation and hate the other. I think eventually we're supposed to learn to not have a favorite house. We eventually have to learn that we're all just human, even White Walkers. Do you think that with George R. R. Martin's known feminism and historic inspiration, the series will turn towards a feminist regime in Westeros? Sansa in the North, Danny in the Crownlands, and Yara in the Iron Islands, imitating Mary Queen of Scots, Elizabeth I, and Grace O'Malley the Pirate Queen? I don't know if we'll have that exact analogy, but it's all but certain that we're heading towards women ruling Westeros, with those particular rulers being inspiration. First of all, George R. R. Martin is a huge fan of English history, and D&D actually met studying Irish literature at Trinity College in Ireland. So it would be impossible for them not to think of Grace O'Malley with regards to Yara, a female pirate. So absolutely, they're looking to this for their source material. And yes, it's hard not to notice that Westeros is ruled by women now, with the men around them being largely emasculated, either figuratively or literally. Now, obviously, this is the internet, so I've gotten a lot of angry comments about feminism and how the show seems to be pushing it too hard. To be fair to the show, the book is pretty darn heavy-handed with its feminist message. I mean, fuck, the plot is about a dragon queen who leads an army of castrated men, for Christ's sake. Meanwhile, a female knight who is inspired by a mother's strength goes around searching for a daughter while rape-stabbing bandits in the Riverlands. And the Princess of Dorne mounts a rebellion over the specter of patriarchy. There has never been anything subtle about the feminist message of Ice and Fire. It's pretty darn explicit. That said, I do find the feminist aspect of Game of Thrones a bit weird. This isn't just a story about some powerful people who happen to be women. No, there is clearly a message to it. And now I am a man talking about this message which came from two other men's adaptation of another man's writing to an audience of mostly men. I do feel like a certain gender's perspective is being left out of this huge exercise in feminism. I'm just saying, if you're gonna have Passover dinner, you should probably invite a Jew. I mean, I can't avoid talking about feminism because it's such a huge part of the story, 
but it's likely going to be a clumsy explanation of D&D's clumsy adaptation of George R. R. Martin's clumsy perspective. So have patience with me. 500 meters in 80 seconds? That means Rickon had to run 25 kilometers an hour for 80 seconds. Don't you think Rickon would have run at most 10 kilometers an hour considering he has been in a dungeon for the last two months and is still a kid? Well, I do think 500 meters in 80 seconds is fairly reasonable for a boy his age. I was close to being the slowest kid on the track team when I was 14, and I ran a 64 second 400. But there's a lot of things to think about. The Starks are natural athletes. Yes, he's been sitting in a dungeon for a mystery amount of time, anywhere from two weeks to two years. He's also running for his life and has all of that adrenaline. And he started about 30 meters out to begin with. But the main point is even if he only made it half that distance, 250 meters, he is beyond the effective range of a longbow, meaning the arrow might be able to go that far, but not with any accuracy at all. At about 400 meters, he is essentially out of the range of a longbow period. The longest mark at the London practice ground at Finsbury Field, for example, was 345 meters. Not to mention there's a huge difference between a flight arrow and the heavy arrow that killed Rickon. The point is, Rickon totally shouldn't have been hit, and Ramsey might as well be Hawkeye. Did Sansa not tell Jon about Littlefinger's army because she didn't want a siege? The only way her actions make sense is if she was hoping to avoid a siege. Allowing Ramsay to bring out his entire army was the only way to quickly eliminate him and take back Winterfell. If Ramsay knew he was outnumbered, he would have holed up. So I actually got a lot of questions similar to this one. Essentially, is there a logic to hiding the Vale army to make Ramsay feel overconfident and leave Winterfell and thus avoiding a siege situation? Well, if we're talking about saving Rickon, the King of the North, the Lord of Winterfell, the brother of Sansa and Jon, no, there is no logic to hiding the Vale army. Only if Ramsay sees his opponents as superior is he going to negotiate. I mean, honestly, step back. Imagine for a moment that a crazy person has taken over your house and held the loved one hostage. Would you be more concerned with negotiations to get the loved one released, or would you be more concerned with fighting and getting your house back? I imagine for all of you, the loved one takes precedence over everything else. Rickon is her brother. Winterfell is a pile of stones. What's amazing is that a very similar situation actually happened in the book in A Clash of Kings. Theon held Winterfell and a hostage, Beth Cassell, and a superior force, Roderick Cassell, was outside. The eventual solution that Theon almost took was to surrender the castle and the hostages if he could take the Black. Now maybe Ramsay wouldn't accept that, but imagine if they offered him the Dreadfort. That would be a really good deal. I imagine that Ramsay would probably release Rickon and go home. And there's honestly an infinite number of other things they could negotiate for. The point is, Rickon was 100% savable, and Sho Sansa got him killed. But now let's assume that Sansa was evil and wanted Rickon dead, or just didn't care about Rickon. And on top of this, didn't really care about Jon. Is there any tactical reason for keeping the Vale secret from your own men? Did Sansa want to avoid a siege? Now, I actually don't understand why a siege would be a bad thing. If you're on the outside of Winterfell, you can easily resupply your troops through Castle Sirwin or through the River the White Knife. Ramsay, on the other hand, would eventually run out of food. A siege would actually be a pretty fantastic situation. Now, some might say, oh no, but winter is coming. You don't want to end up like Book Stannis. Keep in mind, a big reason that Book Stannis was doing so poorly was the fact that he and his troops were Southerners. Jon and Sansa's army was Northerners and Wildlings. And it's not like the Vale armies aren't used to snow. Plus, as I said, they would have resupply through Castle Serwin and the White Knife. So yeah, go for a siege. Sounds great. Who in the hell is running the Dreadfort? Well, in these sorts of situations, they usually assign a castellan. So it's probably some random Bolton bannerman. I imagine with the death of Ramsay, he would immediately surrender. But speaking of random Bolton lackeys, I wonder what happened to that maester. I hope he shows up next episode. When the slavers are attacking Marine, aren't they using slave soldiers, the very people Danny is trying to save? Or because they are soldiers, it makes it okay to burn their ship even before they had completed negotiations. This is a good point. Yes, they are slave soldiers, and yes, these are the very people Danny is trying to save. Danny was also considering burning their cities to the ground, cities that contain mostly slaves. Of course, one of the main points of the series, at least the book series, is that innocent small folk die over the squabbling of lords. This is actually a rather big thing with regard to the Sansa story. She started a war to essentially get revenge on Ramsay. Maybe 8,000 innocent people and her brother died? They didn't do anything wrong. These were poor farm boys who happened to be born on Dreadfort land and then got called up to serve. And of course, this situation is true of nearly all wars. Where the hell is Ghost? Who is babysitting Lyanna Mormont during the battle? 
Do you think the fact we pretty much haven't seen Ghost since John's resurrection is a budget thing, or that John is in Ghost and the writers have actually done something intelligent? So I imagine Liana was playing fetch with Ghost all during this battle. The whole scene was probably cute and adorable. But as you guys may know, when the season began, I had high hopes that something interesting was going on with Ghost. After all, A Dance with Dragons opens with a long chapter about how wargs have the ability to send their disembodied consciousness into animals after death and live second lives. And of course, A Dance with Dragons ends with John getting stabbed and speaking Ghost's name. And a ghost is, by definition, a disembodied consciousness. All the pieces are there in the book for John to live a second life in Ghost. And so when this season began, I fully expected John's consciousness to be in Ghost and was very suspicious of this resurrected John. I was thinking that John was perhaps a soulless puppet. But it seems I was wrong. John's desire to save his little brother, his fear in battle, his lamentation of past events, all these signs point to him being legitimately John. And he wasn't a warmonger, something that I imagine a puppet master would want him to be. So I suppose now the question is, who or what healed John and why? I imagine it's the same thing that healed Beric, but who or what is that? Melisandre believes that it's the Lord of Light, but are there really gods in this universe? I sure as hell hope there's a more interesting answer than Durr magic. But yeah, it's probably a budget thing that we haven't seen Ghost. Grey Wind used to fight with Rob in battle, so it would have been kind of nice to see Ghost in battle next to Jon. How does the human dragon link work, do you think? Is it like warging the wolves? And how could Daenerys cue the others to draw fire? Can she have a mental link with more than just Drogon? Well, long story short, I do think that warging and dragon riding are fundamentally the same thing. They are essentially telepathic bonding with another being and the blending of consciousness. What we have with Danny controlling many dragons is on the one hand different from the book, but also similar to the book. So in the book we are told that it's a one dragon rider to one dragon relationship. No person has ever ridden or controlled two dragons, and no dragon has ever accepted more than one rider at the same time. However, a dragon may take on a new rider if the old rider dies, and similarly, a rider may take on a new dragon if their old dragon dies. So I would say without a doubt, there is some sort of telepathic bond going on between dragon and rider. Except for the dragon rider Nettles, who is special, but that's a whole nother story. So Danny in the book only has a telepathic bond with Drogon, but here in the show, Danny seems to have a telepathic bond with all three of her dragons. So this is new, but I'm gonna say it's not completely without precedent. We could view Danny's telepathy as fundamentally the same thing as Warg's telepathy. All of the Stark children seem to have telepathic bonds with their wolves instead of a dragon. Now there are some differences between dragon riders and wargs, as wargs cannot just control their wolves, but they can actually fully put their consciousness inside their wolves. Additionally, the Stark children can switch their telepathic bonds. Bran can not only warg Summer, but he can also warg Hodor. Arya can not only warg Nymeria, but can also warg a cat. In the book, we have never seen Danny have that sort of telepathic control with Drogon. In fact, in the book, Danny can barely control Drogon at all. But who knows what'll happen to Danny's telepathy in the future. Now I should mention that in the book there is a character called Baromir Sixskins, who is one of the most powerful telepaths in the world. He can control six different animals at the same time. Now I don't know if the showrunners put this much thought into the Danny scene. In fact, I'm almost certain they didn't. But using the book's logic, if Danny can control three dragons at once, she has proven herself to be one of the most powerful telepaths in history. How is John going to bury Rickon with his father when I didn't think Rob got his remains back? You are correct, it's exceedingly unlikely that Ned's bones are in the crypts. Ned's bones were delivered to Cat in Renly's camp near Storm's End in Season 2, Episode 4. Cat then flees without the bones the next episode when Renly dies. So in all probability, the bones were left behind there. But let's say for the sake of argument that Cat, for some odd reason, sent the bones ahead of her. Well, the problem is the Ironborn invade the North in the fifth episode of season two, and Theon takes Winterfell in the sixth episode. So unless the Bones got there really, really fast and were accepted by Bran off screen, they shouldn't be down there. On top of this, Bran spends time in the crypts in season two, and Sansa visits the crypts in season five, and we get no scene with Ned's grave or his bones. Ned's missing bones are actually an interesting plot point in the book, Cat receives the bones at River Run and then orders Hal Malin to take them north. Hal and the bones then vanish from the story. Cat later wonders what happened to them, and Lady Dustin puts men at the neck to look for the bones, but no one ever brought them north. So Ned's bones are kind of another missing object out there, like Rob's will. We have no idea where the bones are or if they're going to be important later on. 
Now you may say, well, who cares about some stupid bones? Well, it's kind of significant because followers of the old gods generally believe that their souls go into the Werewood Net after they die. However, Starks are different. They put their bodies in crypts and believe that their souls are locked in by iron swords. So when we talk about Ned's bones being missing, it's not just that it's his bones that are missing, it may be that his memories and consciousness are missing. And it even goes beyond that. Metaphorically, Ned has never been put to rest. Rob started a war over Ned and a cycle of revenge. In a sense, five books later, Ned's ghost is still haunting us. So yeah, I'll actually kind of be annoyed if Ned's bones end up in the crypts in the show. Does it make sense to you that Yara agreed to the pact with Daenerys? Unless she plans to give it up right away, the Ironborn in the show are all about the iron price as their way of living. I would not think Yara could enforce this new lifestyle. I think it's highly probable that Yara will betray Danny. The Greyjoy words are, we do not sow, and Yara is 300% Greyjoy. Theon is about 7% Greyjoy at this point. So Danny is asking Yara to go against her house and the Ironborn way of life. That doesn't seem like Yara. Keep in mind, she just made a speech at the Kingsmoot about how the Ironborn need to be more warlike and make a bigger impact on the world. Theon praised her as a real reaver, and now Danny wants her to be not a reaver? Look, Greenlander living may work with many book Ironborn and may work for Asha Greyjoy, but I'm simply not seeing it with show Ironborn or Yara. Additionally, dragons are a clear metaphor for nuclear weapons. George R. Martin has related the two many times in interviews. And the story of nuclear weapons is that of proliferation. Essentially, Rhaegel and Viserion need to be stolen. After all, there is simply no reason to have three dragons in the story if the three dragons remain together and are controlled by the same party. You could achieve the same thing with one dragon. Of course, with Danny having seeming telepathic control over all three of her dragons, I don't actually see how anyone could steal her dragons, but this may be a plot hole. Nonetheless, I think it's quite likely that Yara will be stealing a dragon. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't one of the themes of the book that revenge is bad, much in the manner of war is bad? D&D seemed to perpetuate the exact opposite. Some review sites called what happened to Ramsay poetic justice. D&D screw up a lot, but they understand the basic themes of the story. They wouldn't have had Septon Ray earlier this season if they didn't understand that revenge and war are bad. Not to mention, think back to Joffrey's death and how that was done. After all Joffrey had done, we felt guilty seeing a poor scared boy die. I think perhaps they wanted the audience to look at Ramsay's death and say, oh my gosh, Sansa's become so dark. But I think perhaps it just wasn't executed well. Ramsay says that he's part of Sansa and our minds all go to pregnancy. Of course, he may be talking about his savagery. Sansa may be the new Ramsay. As Septon Ray said, violence is a disease and now Sansa has caught it which may explain why she sacrificed Rickon and nearly killed Jon. She may have gone batshit insane. That would make a better story than the 75 plot holes. To D&D's credit, they made war look absolutely horrible in this episode. And are we really supposed to feel good about Sansa feeding a human being to dogs and smiling about it afterwards? I think anyone that looked at the last episode and saw a happy ending is fundamentally missing the point of the series. Ramsay got his, but it was such an incredible cost. Thousands of men. Rickon's life, possibly the last giant, Sansa's sanity. For what? Revenge and a pile of stones. How come no one noticed the conversation between Davos and Tormund and how they were wrong in serving kings, but then says something like, at least Jon is not a king? Is that another hint that Jon is actually the rightful king? Well, first off and foremost, there is no rightful king. And I mean that in many ways. Divine right and monarchy and feudalism are stupid. And both book and show have been very clear in showing this. But even if you accept that feudalism is awesome, no one is ever going to agree about who the rightful king is. Stannis was Renly's elder, and yet there was still a disagreement. Euron won the king's moot fair and square, yet there's still a disagreement. Even if we suppose R plus L equals J, you would need everyone in the world to agree that Targaryen rule was legitimate, that polygamy is fine, and that Night's Watch vows mean nothing. That's never going to happen. And even if everyone in the world felt John was super duper and he sat the Iron Throne as some enlightened king, it doesn't matter because he's eventually going to die. And then his fuck up kids would likely ruin everything again. I think when Davos and Tormund were criticizing monarchy, they were criticizing monarchy. Is Littlefinger the most powerful man in Westeros right now? Probably not. So right now there's essentially no northern fighters left. He does control the Vale army, but that Vale army doesn't compare in size to what's in the Reach. Even if King's Landing burns down and kills all of the Tyrell soldiers there, 
there's really plenty more where that came from back in the Reach, which was untouched by war. Even the Sand Snakes army might rival the Vale army in size. And of course, there's the Night's King's army. Although Littlefinger's army is one of the farthest from getting burned by Danny's dragons, he's one of the first to get destroyed by the Night's King. So overall, Littlefinger is in a good position, but he's not in a dominating position. Given that we all agree that Sansa warged the missing hounds that ate the sixth Bolton man off screen, did she have to warg the hounds that ate Ramsay, or were they just hungry? Now this is a fun little question. Obviously the missing hounds in the sixth Bolton man are just a plot hole, and those hounds hadn't eaten in eight days. But the larger question is, does Sansa have telepathic abilities? Now what's interesting is the show hasn't given telepathic abilities to any Stark children except for Bran. In the book, it seems that all the Stark children have telepathic abilities. Jon, Bran, Arya, and Rickon can all warg their wolves. Sansa, though, is wolfless, unless you count the Hound himself. So I do wonder if her telepathic abilities have manifested differently. The Hound, Tyrion, Littlefinger, and Sweet Robin have all fallen in love with her. Is it just that she's hot, or perhaps she has some sort of power of suggestion over people? Regardless, I don't think we'll be seeing this in the show. What's the A Song of Ice and Fire lore on matrilineal marriages? Has there ever been one of any significance? If not, Rickon's death would be the end of House Stark for all Sansa knows, wouldn't it? Well, not necessarily. There are a few ways for the Stark line to continue. The first way is, of course, legitimizing Jon. Rob's will may or may not do this, or Sansa, if she's Queen of the North, could do this. But legitimizing Jon and handing over Winterfell to him is not really in her best interest. A second way is Dornish Law. In the book, the Dornish clearly want Dornish law to apply to all of Westeros. And there are hints that Cersei would be game for this. Under Dornish law, if the ruler of a fief is a lady, the surname will follow the lady. However, the Dornish story has largely been cut, so we won't see this. The third way may be legitimizing a bastard child. In the book, Egret tells a story to Jon that the Lord of Winterfell only had a daughter and their line was about to die out. The daughter of Winterfell was then kidnapped by a wildling called Bale the Bard and had a child. And that child, according to the story, became Lord of Winterfell. How that is is a bit of a mystery. They may be considered married under wildling custom, and the wildlings are more matrilineal, but it's never really explained. The whole story is probably bull, but the fourth way is the most likely. Someone can just choose to take her name. In A Clash of Kings, a widow named Lady Hornwood is left without an heir, and suddenly she is flooded with suitors and various people that want to become the heir of Hornwood. Lord Tallheart comes forward and suggests that his younger son, who's half Hornwood, simply change his name and become the heir. So at the end of the day, Sansa can just demand that her husband take the name Stark and that all of her children will have the name Stark. And that's all for now. See you guys in a few days for episode 10.